Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Richard Such. Uh, I am a past president of MSV and current member of the MSV Board of Directors. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Scott Johnson and Ben Trainum from Hancock, Daniel & Johnson for this morning's webinar, 2019 Balanced Billing Legislation, What This Means for Your Practice. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers this morning. Many of you already know Scott Johnson. Scott has lobbied for clients on the front line of healthcare legislation for over 25 years. His steadfast presence in the Virginia General Assembly has earned the recognition and respect of an ever-changing roster of influential legislators and statewide office holders who seek his counsel when governing the most complex healthcare issues facing clients today. The MSV has been honored to have him and his team working with us for many years. Tim Trainum draws upon his unique experience to provide tailored service to clients. Understanding the intersection of government and industry, he is able to apply that knowledge to solve complex issues facing clients. Ben joined Hancock Daniel after serving as Senior Policy Advisor and Counsel to the U.S. House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, where he drafted legislation and advised the committee on matters related to public health, energy technology, and the environment. Welcome, Ben and Scott. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If your question is not answered, please email the MSV team at governmentaffairs at msv.org. That's governmentaffairs at msv.org. As is with all of our webinars, uh, this session will be recorded and posted on the website. So on behalf of the membership and staff of the Medical Society of Virginia, I'd like to thank you all for taking time to be with us this morning. And I'll now hand it over to Scott and Ben. Thank you, Dr. Such. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate you joining us. Ben and I are pleased to be with you this morning. Um, we're gonna uh, give you a little bit of background on the balanced billing uh, issue that our Virginia General Assembly tackled, uh, go through the Virginia statute, uh, and then Ben is going to go through legislation that is uh, passed in Congress at the federal level that will become effective and then try to give you some um, examples of how this is going to affect how you practice and, uh, and where it goes. Uh, as the, uh, the title indicated, we're going to start in 2019, even though the legislation actually passed in 2020. And the reason we're starting there is in the fall elections in 2019, the members of the General Assembly, as they knocked on doors campaigning, one of the key issues they heard from constituents was complaints about balanced billing. Either somebody went to an emergency room and didn't realize that their ER doctor was out of network, or somebody went to a hospital for surgery and did not realize their anesthesiologist was out of network, the pathologist was out of network, the hospitalist was out of network. Uh, some patients reported that they had done everything right. They had checked with their insurance company, they had checked with the hospital, and that was a recurrent issue. And that prompted our legislators here to say, we have to do something. So in the 2020 session, uh, legislation was introduced by several different members of the House and the Senate, but predominantly um, the uh, legislation uh, was narrowed down into a single new statute that passed in Virginia. It took a lot of work. Uh, it had been something that had been discussed well before the 2019 elections uh, and the real heart of the negotiations took place during the uh, 2020 General Assembly session. The Medical Society, the Hospital Association, the Poverty Law Center, and obviously the Virginia Association of Health Plans, which represents the carriers. As of 2020, we really didn't have other states that we could look to to try to model from, with the exception of one, and that was the state of Washington. The state of Washington had passed balanced billing legislation and it had only been in effect a matter of months. And so consulting them and asking their medical society, asking their hospital association, what did you see? What were the pitfalls? What do you consider? How did it go through? Uh, and so we modeled the Virginia statute largely on that here. And as you will see, now we've got close to 17 states that have acted on this issue. And as I mentioned, Ben will talk with you about what happened in Congress in 2020. That federal legislation 
has a delayed effective date of 2022. So it is not the law today, but our state statute that passed became law January 1, 2021. So you've lived with this uh, for about uh, four months. Okay, next screen. So what does the law require and, and how does it work? Uh, it basically prohibits you, if you are a physician as an out-of-network provider, from balance billing patients in certain instances. Number one, if you're an out-of-network provider, you can't balance bill a patient for emergency services. And number two, if you're an out-of-network provider and you're providing non-emergency services like surgical services or other type of imaging or pathology at an in-network facility, you can't balance bill. It's important to tease out the words and we hate to get down in the weeds, but that's really important to know the scope and, and when this is applied. The balance billing prohibition is tied to covered services, meaning that if you've got insurance with Anthem and Anthem provides coverage for a particular service, then this balance billing statute and prohibition will apply. As opposed to a situation where you decide that you wanna go in and have a, an elective procedure, an eye lift, a nose job, something like that, that may not be a covered service, um, then you are not going to have the, the balance billing uh, provisions that are going to come into play. Um, you need to then ask yourself, who's covered by this from an insurance perspective? The first thing is the easy one. Does this apply to Medicare and Medicaid? And the answer is no, because you can't all, today it's against the law to balance bill uh, in those arenas. And as we like to tell people, you can balance bill once in Medicare and Medicaid and you'll probably go to jail. So we don't recommend that that be the case. So this uh, new law applies to the commercial insurance market. Uh, so those are the individual or group plans that are written in Virginia that are governed by Virginia law. There's also the ability for a self-insured plan, and some of you probably heard the phrase ERISA plan, for those to opt in to be covered by this. And our Bureau of Insurance has set up a separate portion of their website uh, devoted to balance billing. And on that website is a form that once a year insurers can come in and fill out. So if you are a self-insured ERISA plan with a big employer, say Capital One, Altria, something of that nature, those plans can opt in to be subject to the balance billing prohibition. We learned from the state of Washington that they had a very high number of self-insured or ERISA plans that elected to opt in to receive this benefit. Um, the next group we wanted to talk about is Virginia has got a large population of state employees, individuals employed by the Commonwealth of Virginia. They too are governed by these balance billing rules. Um, now, if you um, move from the prohibition on balance billing, another key provision is, okay, what are you entitled to get paid and what does a patient have to pay? The law basically says that if you're an out-of-network provider, that that patient's insurance company, one, has to pay you directly. We had heard many examples where insurance companies were writing the check to the patient and we know once the patient gets a check, it's no guarantee they're gonna pay their healthcare provider. They could pay rent, they could buy food, they could go on a vacation. This legislation says, if you're the out of network provider here, the check's gotta come from the insurance company to you. Uh, two, the insurance company has got to pay you a commercially reasonable amount. And that basically is a formula where they are looking to what is a similar type payment for that type of service in that same geographic area. So our Bureau of Insurance worked with an actuary, worked with the Virginia Health Information, VHI, to look at claims data and come up with what is a commercial reasonable amount that's available to all providers. It's an Excel spreadsheet. So you can go in and look by CPT code or other revenue code, however you're billing, to say what's uh, on this list, what is deemed to be a commercial reasonable amount. As to the patient, the patient is still responsible for their cost sharing, their deductibles, their co-pays. Those have to be calculated by the carrier in the same way they do for everybody else. They can't skew that. So if you were the out of network provider providing emergency services, that patient's insurance company would send you a check that's supposed to be a commercial reasonable amount and then you may bill that patient for any copay or deductible that they owe. Um, 
and that's uh, that's the the structure of that. So suppose you make a mistake, an unintended mistake, and you overbill the patient, or you collect more from the patient. The balance billing statute basically says you need to refund them uh, with interest, and that is mirrored on the situation of our fair business and ethics practice standard that says if a health insurance company does not pay you within 40 days of getting a clean claim, they have to pay you with interest. So there's parity of where that comes from. Some have asked us, are healthcare providers who are out of network providers able to get a patient to sign a document to waive their rights under this? Or another way to say it, can a out of network provider get a patient to sign a contractual agreement that says, notwithstanding what's in the statute, I waive my rights and I agree to pay you X amount. And the answer to that is no, that, that's not permitted um, as we go. Next screen, please. So what happens if I'm that out of network provider, I'm that hospitalist, I'm that pathologist, I've gotten a check from XYZ insurance company. I realize that the patient owes a $50 copay or deductible and I bill the patient for that. And I'm, I'm not happy with what the insurance company sent to me. They have established in statute and through rules at our state corporation commission, uh, basically an arbitration process that lets us try to work through those disputes. And it, it's set up on a pretty tight clock as far as how many days each person has to act. And you see the first bullet there is you've gotten that check as a provider. You've got to um, uh, work with the carrier and basically built in the statute good faith negotiations, telling the carrier you sent me $100. I think commercial reasonable amount for this is 150. You try to have good faith negotiations back and forth. Uh, they don't want these disputes to draw out over a long period of time. The ultimate issue is if you can't work it out with the insurance company, then you've got the ability to arbitrate your difference. And the Bureau of Insurance has a list of arbiters that the uh, insurance company and you would select from. If you go to arbitration, the cost of arbitration is split between the physician and the insurance company. But one thing is clear, in this whole dispute process, the patient is held harmless. You can never go back and get additional money from the patient. So only their copay, only their deductible. If they don't pay those, the question has come up, well, can I send them to collections? The answer is yes. If that patient owed a copay or deductible that they did not pay on time, you can proceed and, and go after them. But if you don't like what comes in the uh, arbitration process of $100 from the insurance company and you wanted $150, you can't bill that patient for the difference. The patient is held harmless in that process. The patient is really not even involved in the arbitration process at all. They want it to be completely uh, taken out uh, of that as we go. Um, oftentimes, your dispute may involve several different codes that you got reimbursed for or several different patients where this insurance carrier sent you an amount that you thought was not commercially reasonable. And the question is, if you're going to go to arbitration, do you have to have one arbitration for every code or can you bundle or put things together? The way the statute is worded, a single provider with a single tax ID number can bundle their claims and take multiple claims to the arbiter, but a practice as a whole cannot take bundle claims. So if I'm in a physician practice with 10 physicians and we each have a separate tax identification number, then you can do bundling per individual, but the whole practice can lump all the claims together and take them in as one. Uh, to go forward on that. Arbitration uh, usually is in two different types. You can have arbitrations not only in balanced billing, but any type of business where there are no parameters on offers and counter offers. And oftentimes an arbiter may be free to pick any number he or she wants to pick. Uh, that is a, a more flexible arbitration process. What the General Assembly elected to do here and what tracked what was passed in Washington is baseball style arbitration. And Ben's going to tell you about that uh, because that's also coming up in, in federal law. So let's uh, flip to the next screen if we can. Taylor, thank you. So uh, a couple of things to keep in mind and basically ask yourself these questions. 
what do I need to do as a provider or think about? And well, number one, you need to provide notice to patients of their rights. And the Bureau of Insurance has put on their website a notice form that you can download and use. Uh, they've got it in English, Spanish, Korean, and Vietnamese. And those forms need to be posted and made available to patients. So the Bureau of Insurance has made that very uh, easy for you to, to use uh, as you go. But, you know, as you, as you tease through uh, each scenario or situation, you've got to ask yourself, are you out of network or not? You've got to ask yourself, where is the service being rendered? If it's a non-emergency service, is that facility, meaning that hospital, that ASC, are they in network or not? Because that will be a factor to determine if the balance billing rules apply. And the third thing you've got to ask yourself is what service I'm delivering, is it covered by that patient's health insurance plan? And one thing that was very important that we secured in the statute is making sure that the insurance companies have a ready, easy way for you to determine what's covered by that patient and a ready, easy way for those patients to determine who's in network and who is not. The third thing we made it very clear is you would have no way to know if a self-insured or ERISA plan has opted in or not. And the Bureau, when those plans opt in on an annual basis or by their policy year, is going to make that available too. So we tried to make sure that the rules of the road had good communications. Some have expressed concerns over situations that we describe in two categories. We have had some providers call us after this law went into effect and say that they uh, commonly provide procedures to patients. Those procedures may be covered, but those patients sought them out because they are quote unquote best in the field. Uh, and the quality of their care means a patient is willing to sign a contract to say, my health insurance may pay you $3,500, but I'm willing to sign a contract to say that I will pay you $5,000 and that difference I agree to make up. Uh, if that is a covered service and if that physician is out of network and that surgery is gonna be done at an in-network facility, the balance billing rules apply and this rule would prohibit you from continuing that business practice. So you ask yourself, what solution could I look to? And one solution would be one, do you want to negotiate to join that provider network? In reality, I think many people would say, if that was a network that reimbursed me at a, at a fair amount, I would consider doing that, but probably they haven't, hence that's why I'm out of network. And two, you need to ask the question, is there an ability to change where that service is provided? Do you have the ability to move from it being provided at an in-network hospital or ASC to an out-of-network ASC? Um, so those are, are potential things, but one thing you can't do is ask that patient to waive their rights uh, as, they, uh, as they look to that. So with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Ben, and he's going to uh, pick up on the next screen. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so the federal law, uh, this was just passed, as Scott mentioned, in December of 2020. Uh, it was a part of a huge omnibus federal government spending bill that included COVID-19 relief. It was tucked in there somewhere around page uh, and it was a surprise to many, including us, uh, that the that Congress was able to reach uh, this agreement and and pass the federal fix to balance billing. Um, there are still a lot of questions as to how it affects state law and how it will impact us here in Virginia, and we'll discuss that a little bit today um, and give you an idea of of what we know now. But essentially. Uh, the bill uh, or the, the new federal law is similar to what we have here in Virginia. It prohibits balance billing for emergency services. It adds emergency air transport services and non-emergency services at in-network facilities. Uh, it holds that patients are only responsible for in-network cost-sharing amount. The in-network cost sharing for surprise bills will be uh, based on what's called what they're calling a recognized amount, which in most cases will be the median in-network payment under the same under the plan for same or similar services. Regulations, uh, the federal government 
is required to draft regulations regarding the methodology uh, of calculating this recognized amount um, by July 1 of this year. So we'll have a little bit more information on that this summer uh, in terms of how that compares to our, our, our amount that, that uh, under Virginia law. Um, and then also uh, the federal law requires HHS to create a provider patient uh, arbitration process uh, again, this will be similar to what we have here in Virginia. It's a baseball style arbitration. And what that means is each party submits one final offer. And then the arbitrator chooses one or the other. The arbitrator can't go in and, 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 and go with the middle or anything between those two offers. Um, and this is designed uh, to kind of force those two offers to be reasonable. Um, and, and, and force that uh, both sides to, to offer a realistic amount um, as opposed to what they, what they want, essentially, uh, and also to speed up the process. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit on the preemption here. Uh, state balance billing laws are not preempted unless they prevent the, applica the application of federal law. So one of the big issues that Scott just discussed um, is this is a huge difference between the federal and state law. The federal law will allow the out-of-network provider to negotiate in advance and provide 72-hour notice to the patient that the position is one, out of network, two, provide a good faith estimate of the cost of the services, and three, provide a list, if any, of, of in-network providers at that facility. Uh, this exception does not apply to ancillary services, such as lab services, radiology, uh, anesthesiology, et cetera, that may be performed. Um, however, in, in the case that Scott described, um, let's say it's a covered service, uh, something along the lines of, of a plastic surgery procedure where um, perhaps it's a covered service, but the, the provider's out of network, the provider can provide this notice to the patient 72 hours in advance uh, with an agreed upon amount and the patient can sign that and that way the provider can balance bill the patient after the fact. That is not the case in, in Virginia law as Scott just described. So here a uh, position that we will be taking with the State Corporation Commission when they determine on how uh, the federal and state laws will interact with each other once the federal law becomes effective next year, well the position we'll take is that the state law prevents the application of this provision of federal law. So we want the ability of providers who are out of network to be able to negotiate in advance a cost uh, of the procedure provided that the patient agrees to it and, and signs, signs off on it 72 hours in advance. Um, another, uh, Thing we wanted to point out, uh, this is similar to what we have here in Virginia. The federal law gives insurers uh, and providers 30 days to try to negotiate payment of out-of-network bills. Um, if that fails, uh, the claims will go through the baseball style arbitration process that we just discussed. Um, and then a little bit about that arbitration. Again, this is to encourage uh, a reasonable offer from both sides. Federal law prohibits physicians and hospitals from using their billed charges and insurers from using Medicare or Medicaid rates uh, during arbitration. So again, this is the idea that they're trying to force uh, reasonable offers um, and then they'll choose one or the other. Um, one thing I also wanted to point out under state law uh, as Scott mentioned, ERISA plans may opt in uh, 
whereas under federal law, ERISA plans are expressly, uh, the federal law expressly applies to ERISA plans. Um, also, uh, by July 1 of this year, HHS uh, has to develop regulations for a, uh, a mechanism through which they can receive consumer patient complaints uh, regarding balance billing scenarios. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the federal law will take effect on January 1 of 2022. Next slide, please. These are just a couple of resources for you all. Um, State Corporation Commission Bureau of Insurance. This is that website will give you a little bit of an idea of, of some of the, the issues that Scott discussed. It also provides links to the notice of consumer rights that all uh, providers have to uh, have on their website and available to patients. Um, and then also a, uh, a brief summary of the Virginia law that our law firm did uh, last year after it passed. And then a federal, um, a good link for a, a summary of the federal law and how it applies. Um, Kaiser Family Foundation has a really good, uh, kind of a, a long, long but short summary of, of the federal law and uh, will give you a good idea of that. Um, and next slide, please. I uh, see there might be a couple of questions. Scott, do you have anything to add before we jump into the No, and I, I think everybody can see them, but I'm gonna read it just to make sure. Um, the first question says, does the federal law supersede state law? So let's take that one first, Ben. So a little bit, uh, it's, it does, it's hard to say exactly in what areas the federal law will supersede state law. The state law will still be in effect. The only areas in which the federal law will be uh, will supersede state law will preempt state law are issues where the state law prevents the federal law from applying. So in this instance, you're asking specifically of whether physicians uh, will be able to contract with patients in advance. The position that we'll be taking with State Corporation Commission is, is hopefully yes. Uh, we will, will advocate uh, that the federal law, that the provision allowing, to, allowing providers to contract with patients 72 hours in advance um, will apply and, and, uh, and, and allow uh, provider out of network providers to balance bill patients provided the patient has sufficient notice. And one thing I will just add, the state of Washington tackled the issue about whether providers should be able to contract with patients for a different amount of payment and in essence waive the balance billing rules. They never could work those details out so they don't have that provision in their law. Their law in Washington tracks Virginia in that contracting with patients is basically a waiver and it's prohibited. Um, and we heard a lot from the Virginia Poverty Law Center that wanted to do everything they could to make sure that patients would not be able to waive their rights under this but they, because they thought a waiver was going to open the floodgates and eviscerate this law. Uh, but clearly we will go in and we need more guidance from HHS obviously uh, in July, but clearly we will be taking the position that if a physician contracts consistent with federal law, they should be able to bill according to what they contract with and, and the balance billing will not apply here. Um, second question I see in the chat is, does the balance billing prohibitions apply to the procedures done in the office? And the balance billing language uh, basically applies only to emergency departments, whether they're emergency services. Uh, and if they're non-emergency services, it applies to an in-network facility, which that is defined in the regulations of the Bureau of Insurance to include a hospital, an ASC, a clinic, uh, a skilled nursing facility, but does not uh, expressly include a physician office. So if you had a patient that came in and you need to aspirate a knee, you need to inject steroids, you need to do a small surgical procedure in your office, then generally these balanced billing rules uh, should not apply. Um, 
Then the third question is, I think we've answered it, but just to be clear, uh, we don't think that there will be a need necessarily to amend Virginia law. The first step would be asking the Bureau of Insurance, since they're charged with interpreting this law, to issue guidance and change their regulations to say they will follow federal law such that a physician would be able to contract with a patient 72 hours in advance and have that patient pay the amount of the contract and be exempt from these balanced billing requirements. If the Bureau of Insurance comes back and says they don't have the authority to do that, or they do need a change in Virginia statutory uh, law, then obviously that would be some, the next step. I encourage you, any other questions? I think we had those three. Um, uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Because, sure. First of all, thank you both very much for uh, making a very, very complex issue, I think, understandable. This is, there's so many, um, assets to this. In talking about the ability to contract with the patient 72 hours before, which would allow you to balance bill, uh, clearly that's not going to be possible in some emergency situations. Would that be fair to say? Because you don't yes. have 72 hours. Right. Um, the other thing that I heard Ben say was that you needed to provide the patient with a list of network providers at that facility who uh, offer the service. So that will be a problem for some people, like for example, hospitalists. Hospitalists generally are all one group and they have a contract with the hospital. So there's no non, there's no in network. If, if they're out of network, there's no, there are no in network hospitalists. So what happens in those types of situations? So well, in, in that 72 hour example, it, the hospitalist probably is not gonna be the one that would be contracting with a patient to do a procedure. It's more likely perhaps gonna be somebody that's a spine surgeon, uh, somebody that's a plastic surgeon, uh, uh, um, somebody more on the surgical side. And what this law is saying is if I'm a network orthopedic, sur out of network orthopedic surgeon and I'm contracting with the patient, I would have to give the patient a list of other orthopedic surgeons that do spine surgery at the hospital where I'm gonna be doing the procedure who are in network. And, if, and we, we need to see what the regulations say because they're not out yet, but what, what we anticipate is that if there are no in-network providers at, at that facility, then that just has to be noted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this really applies only to procedures because some of the problems that led to the legislators to want to solve this were not necessarily the, the surgeon. Uh, there, there wasn't a case with where it was a hospitalist. There were cases where it was ancillary services and things. Correct. Con the yeah. federal law will, uh, it, the exception for this 72 hour advance notice will not apply to ancillary services. Uh, so in other words, um, if you're having knee surgery and the, uh, the, the, the surgeon is, is in network, but the anesthesiologist is out of network, the hospital will not be able to contract ahead of time with the patient and say that the anesthesiologist is out of network, so you're going to have to pay that full amount. It does not apply in those situations to the ancillary services. So we've got another question in that deals with um, what appears to be a... Um, a uh, situation where a patient was treated and lab work was sent out to LabCorp who was not uh, part of the practice and they were billed by LabCorp. The patient was told about this. Um, the, the claim was paid at, at an in-network rate and the patient is trying to get out of paying any additional amount for the LabCorp bill, uh, deeming it to be a surprise bill from LabCorp uh, and, and not from the practice, who is correct. So let's see if we can, can tease through this a little bit. So we, uh, if you're assuming that this practice is uh, out, of, uh, an out of network provider with that patient's insurance company, um, that would give you one avenue to go versus whether this practice is in network. Since you said that the claim was paid in network, I assume that the physician's in network, lab core's out of network. Um, and in that situation, uh, LabCorp has been paid an in-network rate and is probably seeking some type of copay or deductible from the patient. Uh, they should be entitled to get that. Uh, if LabCorp is taking the position 
that we're out of network and um, and the insurance company paid us $100 and we think we ought to have gotten $200 and are trying to bill the patient for that, then uh, LabCorp is, uh, for being out of network, is going to uh, have a hard time. They should prevail though, because if you did this in your office, this balanced billing statute is not occurring at a in-network facility. Um, so um, that, uh, that uh, I think, tease through your facts. And if we missed a part of it, let us know. But I, I think in, in that situation, LabCorp is probably going to be the winner in that. Any other right, questions? I see, I see a question now in the chat. We were in the Q&A, so let me move oh, okay. up to that. A uh, question in the chat says, our OB hospitalist um, do surgery, so there is no other option. Um, so I think what we're saying there, what you're asking about there is under the federal law, uh, if your OB hospitalist is going to contract with a patient to do a surgical procedure and there's nobody else at your hospital to do it, as Ben was saying, subject to us seeing the regs come out in July, we would think as long as you document that you told the patient there's no other in-network surgeons to do this procedure at the hospital other than me, then um, you will have complied with federal law. All right, I'm gonna go back to the Q&A list. Um, There's one more there, Scott. Yeah, uh, that's more of a statement. The next part of, okay, here we go again, back on our issue regarding LabCorp. Part of the issue is the patient is trying uh, to bank on quote unquote, I have a surprise bill so I don't have to pay it regardless of LabCorp being a network. Um, I, I feel your pain there because I think patients believe when they get any bill, they're surprised and they may not understand the oh, copay or deductible. And you're right, some patients try to paint the copay or deductible bill from a provider or from LabCorp as being a prohibited surprise balance bill. But in, in fact, it is not. If they are billing you for copays or deductible or your cost share, that's a fair bill. You may be surprised, but the law doesn't deem it a surprise. And uh, I see there in the chat that it, uh, the patient is an attorney. So uh, yeah, they, they, you gotta watch those lawyers, they're, they're slick. <laughs> Anybody there's, else? Uh, there's also a question in the chat. Oh, I see you, I think you got that one, Scott. Yep. Well, we certainly welcome you all. If you have uh, questions on this going forward, uh, don't hesitate to, to call Ben or I or the, or the Medical Society. We will try to keep you informed um, that the final chapter has not been written here. There's much more to come. We need to stay engaged on it uh, and navigate as we go forward. And um, we uh, thank you for your time. And if you have trouble accessing any of the links or resources, uh, just let us know and we'll do that. And Dr. Such, I'll hand back to you. Yeah, there was one last question there uh, related to that OB hospitalist question. So that someone said, so can the OB hospitalist balance bill if, they're, if they've informed the uh, patient that there are no in-network providers? Under the Virginia law today, if that OB hospitalist was trying to have that patient sign a contract for a non-emergency procedure, surgery, whatever it may be, Virginia law would prohibit that uh, out of network OB from balance billing because the hospital is in network, the OB is out of network, Virginia law governs today, um, they're not gonna be able to. What we are waiting to see is what will be the import of federal law when it becomes effective in 2022. That may change that and say you can. So it's basically what we've said is the case for any other proceduralist, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Scott and Ben, thank you very, very much again for this uh, very uh, helpful and uh, thorough discussion of uh, balance billing. Um, and as I said at the beginning, and as Scott just said, if, if you think of questions after the fact, you can uh, directly uh, contact uh, Scott or Ben or uh, the uh, MSB Government Affairs uh, Department, and we will try to uh, get the answers for you. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a good day and a good weekend.